Welcome to the Determined Truth Podcast. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Where we aim to explore questions of truth, the scriptures, and what it means for the church today. Here are your hosts, Rob Dalrymple and Vinny Angelo. Hi, everyone. <laughs> hey, everyone. Welcome in. We are returning back to Second Corinthians, which was, we're going to basically do last week's episode. Because well, that's we the started, plan. Should we, we, should we, we promise that? <laughs> we ha- no, the, we are hoping to do last week's episode, which was we started doing last week's episode and then we went on a unscripted tangent for an hour. And so now we're returning to those notes. Yeah. So absolutely. we'll be back in Second Corinthians. Is this one of those times where you need to say Lord willing? I think we probably should always say Lord willing because <laughs> you got two ADD guys who knows how, where it's going to go anyways. Right? Exactly. So oh, attention deficit. Hey, donut. So we're back in Second Corinthians, hopefully chapter six. We've looked at how Paul says, we are the temple of the living God. Yeah. We reflected back on revelation and what that looks like. And we talked about how new creation language, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, how new creation language is central to, you're giving a look. Yeah. I'm like, I don't remember doing that. <laughs> yeah. We did that two weeks ago. I think it was, or maybe so it was like, three you're, weeks ago. You're going over today's notes, Vinny. <laughs> no, I know, but I, we did that a couple of weeks ago. We, okay. we talked about new creation language. We, and for Paul, this that's a prevalent theme yeah, all throughout yeah. the new Testament. Almost every new Testament author yes. talks about that. And we spent a little bit of time talking about that in the episodes. And so for Paul, he obviously uses that language in first Corinthians three and six, he yes. talks about how we are temples of God. And so that's something that we need to re- recall because that's definitely going to sure. be coming up today is that exactly. new yeah. creation and new temple type language. Exactly. And it ties into the end of chapter five, which we'll tie it into uh, today of second Corinthians. You, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making his appeal through us. So uh, today, as we continue on into chapter six, we're going to continue looking at those themes of new creation, temple language, God dwelling with us and what that looks like. And especially how that comes from an Old Testament concept. This isn't merely yeah. a new thing. That's right. Happening. Yeah. Let's begin in Second Corinthians six, verse 16. You want to go ahead and just read verses 16 and 17, Vinny? Sure. Or, or 16, uh, 16, 16 to 18. To, yeah, 16 yeah. to 18. Yeah. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out of them and be separate from them, says the Lord. And touch nothing unclean, then I will welcome you. And I will be your father, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Interesting translation, actually. Yes, NRSV. Yeah, I was interested by verse 16, I will live in them. I'm just looking at the at the Greek, and it's, it means to live, but it has a, a sense of dwell, which most translations, I will dwell among them. And that's kind yeah, of yeah. a key theme. So the Greek actually is really significant here. And just I'm going to get nerdy just for a second here. Verbs in Greek indicate first, second, third person, singular, or plural. Mm-hmm. In English, we don't do that. We, and we have I am, you are, he is. So am, are, and is. But then for the plural, we use are for all of them. So we are, mm-hmm. you are, they are. So if I say is, then we know it's he, she, or it is. It's third person singular. If I say am, we know it's first person singular. But when we say are, we don't know. It could be second person singular or plural, or first person uh, plural or third person plural. In Greek, all the forms are different. So what that means then is the verb ending actually tells you the person. So the verb will be are, and the ending will say I is, in English, we would translate it as I am. so the, the verb ending will be I or you singular or you plural. What that means then is that when you add a pronoun or a subject like I or we, when the word we is added, it's emphatic because it's not necessary. Mm-hmm. It's already in the verbal ending, if that makes sense. And the Greek not only adds the word we here, it's the first word in the clause. Mm-hmm. We are. Actually, it's we temple of God are living in the Greek. So it has the, the word for, so it says in English, for we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell among them and, and walk among them. So the word we then just simply is emphasizing this emphaticness that's we. What's interesting though, is that the verb occurs near the end. So the next word is the temple of God. We, the temple of God are living. Obviously it will be translated better as we are the temple of the living God, but it's just an emphatic statement of Paul. He's making a point and stressing it. He's not just simply making a statement of fact, hey, we are the temple of God. No, we are the temple of the living God. 
it's a really powerful statement. This passage, if you're reading in your Bibles through yeah. verses 16 and 17, usually there's going to be some sort of like indentation. It's going to be offset. In my Bibles, it reads the way the Psalms read here, where there's a lot of okay. open space on the side. So usually this are justified, right? Yes, exactly. In, in, Bible, in my translation, Vinny, it puts a quotation from the Old Testament in all caps. Oh, interesting. Okay. I think I might yeah, have stole your thunder. That's where you're well, going. Well, no, no. I, I was just going to say, it, it, you, you need to see with your translation what they do with certain things like that. So yeah. I, right now I have both the NRSV and the ESV up. And they both do similar things anytime okay. they see. I think they do it just with poetry. And this yeah. is coming from a poetic section of the Old Testament. So that's why they type frame it that way. Huh. Because is this, I, I would need to see is, where is this coming from? It's is coming this from, from Leviticus? Ex- Ezekiel and Leviticus. And I don't think the okay. Leviticus part's poetic. The, yeah, the Ezekiel yeah. part, you might do that. Uh-huh. So, but that's just a way of offsetting. They decided we're going to go ahead and put this as center justified. Center justified means that you have, white space in the left and on the right, but yeah. everything's centered. A block justified means it's just a block left and right or it all yeah. hits, hits the end of the lines, things like that. We normally type in left justified, things like that. Obviously, Hebrew and other languages are right justified because mm-hmm. they start at the right-hand side. So yeah, so they're just doing that to say, we're just trying to find a way to set this off so that this is, is a citation from the Old Testament. And as I said, the New American Standards puts it in all caps. Okay, so what's Paul trying to do here? Because he's obviously talking to... I, we could assume that it might be a mixed ethnic group. It's certainly Gentiles in Corinth. Sure. And I'd even want to go back to the story is, do we have mention of Jewish people in this congregation? Yes. For all we, are, are there? We, we, follow, we follow Cephas. We follow Cephas. Or probably oh, okay. The Jewish... okay, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. So it's going to be mixed ethnic group, but it's I, I'm assuming a predominantly Gentile congregation. It could be. It's argument from mm-hmm. silence. But regardless... Why is Paul using Old Testament passages that speak of Israel as holding a certain role? And now he's putting that up against this is what God's people are, regardless of your ethnic race, because he's identifying them in a very specific, profound way. You got to remember for one, right? They only have the Old Testament. They don't have any other scriptures to cite. He's writing the New Testament. So certainly if he's going to buttress his argument or defend his arguments, like the scriptures even say this. And I think that's what he's doing here. What's extremely significant is to recognize in this instance what verses he's citing and how these verses fill the biblical story. So let's begin with, he's citing Ezekiel 37, which actually there's Leviticus 26 that we'll get to in just a minute. But Ezekiel 37, let me turn there and let's read it, uh, verses 26 and 27. And there's a larger context in Ezekiel that we'll look at. So Ezekiel 37, 26 and and 27. Uh, Do you want to read it or you want me to? I got it. Sure, I got it. Okay. My Bible shrunk again, so I need to put my old man glasses on. I keep keep putting in the wash, and then it shrinks. (laughs) I was going to say, pretty soon it's going to be so small, you're going to need a a magnifying glass. Exactly. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I shall set them in their land and multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My dwelling place shall be with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So it's interesting because now the new revised standard that you're translate. No, this is actually an ESV because I had that open. So that's why. Oh, okay. ESV. All right. Because I was going to say, it's interesting that if it was the new revised standard that they it's went, I will standard. live among them. Yeah. And here it says, my dwelling yeah. place will be among them. So yeah, you can see Paul is quoting this Ezekiel 37 text. And Ezekiel 37 is this promise of this great restoration that God's going to bring about. I think we'll expand on this a little bit more as, as we proceed, but that's one of the key texts. Mm, okay. So this seems this is very covenantal though. Yeah. And he also does quote from Leviticus, as you said. Yes. So what is happening here? And I, I could just imagine though, even and as you go through the text, hearing this as a Gentile who's not part of the covenant, this has got to be a strange thing for me to hear. It's got to be strange if I'm a Jewish person that Paul is writing this about non-Jews. I'm I'm sure that this isn't the first time that they've heard this teaching from Paul and he lived with them in Corinth for a long time. But I could just imagine as someone who has grown up in the, in, in a certain lineage and I've heard things and these are important passages all of a sudden to just say, Oh, and this applies to you guys too. This has got to be a very difficult thing to get through. I can imagine passages like this cause hostility. These are the passages that takes time to work through. Yeah. So what you're alluding to here is in my opinion and i think the large consensus of 
Christian theology. Certainly there's an evangelical wing that will not agree with this, what I'm going to say. And I just wrote a book on this that should be out maybe in the next four to five weeks. Mm -hmm. The idea is that Paul, Jesus, John, the New Testament writers were reading the Old Testament scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament scriptures from a Christological lens. They were reading it in light of Jesus. And of course, it's not just in light of Jesus, because also it's going to be the role of the church as the carrying forth the mission and, and person of Jesus and, and who he was and what he did. So he's so that's the revolutionariness or the revolutionary nature of what Paul's doing. He's looking at. So when you say a covenantal, what, he, what you're referring to is God makes a covenant, an agreement, a treaty with the word treaty is not quite accurate, but it gets the idea across in English with the people of Israel, with Moses and the Israelites. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. And here's the way it's going to work. I'm going to be your God. And I'm going to watch over you and bless you and protect you. I'll protect you from foreign empires. I'll protect you from famine. Your land will have a, b a bounty. Your people will have a bounty. Your animals will have a bounty. If you do your part, and that is obey my laws. Now, we can look at that and go, oh, wow, God's an evil ogre. He's the great king, and you have to obey his laws or he's going to punish you. But actually, it's the goodness of God. It's God's love and his goodness because my laws are good. My laws are just. And if you follow my laws, it creates a good and just society where all people, in fact, Deuteronomy 15 explicitly says, there should be no poor among you. If you do these things, there will be no one poor. If you have poor, you're not doing these things. Hmm. The idea then becomes that when you do these things, I will dwell among you and you will therefore manifest my glory to the nations. And the nations will go, Look how great their God is, because look how blessed they are as a people. And the nations will flow, as the book of Isaiah says, to Israel or to the people of, of, of God. And they will flow inwardly. Of course, they didn't do this, but this is the covenantal formula. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. You'll do these things. It'll create a just society, which, by the way, that's what the word righteousness means. I think we'll get to later on. It refers to God's justice, his righteousness. It's a just society and, and all will be blessed. The, the covenant formula comes from Leviticus 26. And so you see this in Deuteronomy 27 through 30, but you also see this in Leviticus 26 and 27. And let's kind of jump there for a moment. And this is so central to understanding the biblical story. So you might think, oh, Rob and Vinny are just going off in the Old Testament. This, folks, is the story of the Bible from Genesis through Revelation put in, a, in 30 more minutes here. Let's see if we can do it. Kind of Putting it in a 30,000-foot view, here we go. God makes a covenant with his people, and he says in Leviticus 26, here's all the blessings if you obey. And the blessings include, as I just said, uh, blessings on animal. I'll give you rains in the good season in verse 4. Your threshing uh, will last until the grape harvest, so you won't have to worry about food. Uh, verse 6, I'll grant peace in the land so you can lie down. No one's going to make you tremble. Uh, I'll eliminate the harmful beasts from the land, no sword. You know, your enemies, you don't have to worry about them. It's just this abundant blessing upon them as a people. What a nation. And then it says, verse 11, I will, moreover, I'll make my dwelling among you. You will be the place where I dwell. My soul will not reject you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. And I am the Lord and the one who brought you out of Israel, out of Egypt. The three elements of this, I will dwell among them. That's Eden. In Eden, that's where God dwelt. And Adam was brought into the presence of God. Of course, it's always important to remember, Adam was created outside the garden and brought into the garden. Secondly, I will walk among them. That's also Eden. In fact, the verb used here for walk in Leviticus 26 is the same verb used in Genesis 3 verse 8, that God walked in the midst of the garden in the cool of the day. And then thirdly, I will be their God and they will be my people. This is this tremendous language of Eden restored. And Paul's answer is it's fulfilled in you, the Corinthians. That's why when we go back to 2 Corinthians, it's so critical to realize 2 Corinthians 6, because this is fulfilled in you. He's going to say in verse 17, therefore, come out from their midst and be separate because this is who you are. And come out from them because you are not part of the nations and you can't be, as we might say, unequally yoked uh, with the nations. If, does that make sense there? Yeah, sure. It, ma it makes total sense. It, it's interesting, though, because especially you get into this Ezekiel 37 passage. And 
36, 37, 38, and then 40 through 48 usually or popularly get wrapped up yeah. into a dispensational understanding of how to view the end. And this goes into yeah. how a, a, a third temple needs to be built in Jerusalem in order for Jesus to return and rule from there. Um, I, I, I'm just curious. I, I, we don't need to go on yeah. a complete dispensational. No, no, this is, a, this is, a good, this is a definitely a good tangent to go on. Okay, I, I was just gonna say, like, how, how much of that is a misnomer? It's a loaded question. It's a, it's a softball question. But uh, what's a better way of thinking of these passages? Are they connected? Is Ezekiel forty for, through forty eight disconnected? Should we be reading these passages in light of what's happening with Russia invading Ukraine? Uh, just, just how do we want to look at this chunk of scripture? Yeah, this is. A fantastic question. So I did a live stream with Jason Staples, and I'm trying actually to see if Jason will come on for the podcast to mm -hmm. discuss Second Corinthians. I haven't heard back from him just yet. But Jason has done phenomenal work on this issue and on this mm -hmm. question. And basically, the, to summarize it, and the, the live stream that I did is found on the Determined Truth YouTube page. Go to the playlist, Dealing with Difficult Questions, and you'll see this, the title D DDQ, Dealing with Difficult Questions with Jason Staples, What is the Meaning of Israel? fantastic and his basic argument is that the entire new testament is wrestling with this question and arguing that the dry bones of the book of ezekiel have come to life that that god has restored israel and the way he's restored israel is in the conversion of the gentiles and it's a phenomenal argument i think it's exactly correct it's fundamental to understanding the new testament to say paul even if we left it at this Paul is applying Ezekiel 37 and quoting it in 2 Corinthians saying, this is true in you. The mm. argument that, but it's also true in Israel, misses the whole point. Because Paul's argument is the fulfillment, the very essence of this text was leading to this. Even if you go back to Ezekiel 36 and see the text as it leads into this. By the way, I also did a live stream with Jace Broadhurst discussing mm -hmm. Ezekiel. 38 and 39 and the book of Revelation. Jace is an Old Testament scholar. And then we looked at the book of Revelation as well to discuss is the war on Gaza. At the time, Iran had just did a first response attack on Israel. And so, oh, this is the Valley of Dry Bones. This is Ezekiel. This is the prophecy of Gog and Magog and all that stuff. Jace, Dr. Broadhurst and I did a live stream on this. And that's also found on the Determined Truth YouTube page and is found under the playlist Israel-Gaza War. It might be under a few other play playlists as well. I think we have a playlist under eschatology or end times, and mm -hmm. I'm sure it's under that playlist as well. Hey, everyone. We want to thank you for joining us on today's podcast. And we want to remind you that everything we provide at Determined Truth is free of charge. And this even includes all of the teaching that Rob does on a weekly basis to pastors in India and around the world. We don't have any supporters that get special behind the scenes access. But we can only do this with the generous support that comes from those of you who can afford to give. So if you would prayerfully consider supporting us with anything from $5 a month or more, we will continue to work hard to challenge the church to be the church. To give, go to DeterminedTruth.com and click on the Give tab or follow the link in the show notes. But just looking at Ezekiel 36, it starts off by saying, verse 22, Therefore say to the house of Israel, It's not for your sake, O Israel, that I'm about to act, but for my name which you profaned. So Israel abandoned God, they didn't do what God said. They didn't fulfill Leviticus 26. And as a result, they were sent off and they were happened. They were in exile. The book of Ezekiel is written from Babylon. And God's answer is, I will vindicate the holiness of my name, verse 23, which you profane among the nations. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord mm -hmm. when I make myself holy among you in your sight. Skip down to verse 25 now. I will sprinkle clean water on you. Remember, Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be baptized yep. in water and blood yep. and you will be clean. He tells the woman in the well, you should ask for me and I give you living water and you'll never thirst again. This whole water theme in the Gospel of John is picking up on this. I will cleanse you, verse 25 still, from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I'll give you a new heart. This is New Testament theology and put a new spirit within you. I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and I'll give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you, verse 27, and cause you to walk in my statutes. Verse 28, you will live in the land. So clearly, the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, which Jason's going to argue this in great depth, it's a phenomenal point that we discussed in that live stream, that the restoration of God's people by the coming of the Holy Spirit is the restoration of Israel 
promised in the book of Ezekiel. And it says, you'll live on the land that mm -hmm. I gave to your forefathers and I will be your God. And it, it's this Eden language. So it goes on to say in verse 35, they will say this desolate land has become like the garden of Eden. It's this Eden fulfilled. So when we see this Eden language, if you recall back in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul described the church in Corinth as a garden. I planted and Apollos watered. It's this garden imagery. And then he goes on to say, and you are the temple of the living God. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Mm -hmm. So it has this Eden temple language combined. It's clearly the language of Ezekiel being fulfilled in, the, in God's people, which is the restoration of the Jewish people and the Gentiles being included. And now the land, because what do you do? It says that you'll live on the land. And the land becomes expanded as Eden was supposed to expand to encompass the whole earth. And I deal with this in some detail in my new book that's coming out as well. So yeah, I just, if you didn't read it, Vinny, we had an article in Christianity Today that was published on the group that we started up to have yeah, dialogues. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. So we have this dialogue going on that Bruce Fisk and I began over five years ago. And we brought Zionist scholars in. So a Zionist Christian scholar is someone who believes the promises to Israel still apply to Israel. They're, they're Christians who believe the promises are still out, outstanding. And so in that article, they quote some of the Zionist leaders that we brought into the conversation, plus Bruce and myself, but they never articulated Bruce and I's position. They never said, Rob believes this theologically and here's why. But they did articulate the theological position of some of the Zionists in the room. Hmm. And one of them was like, oh, I think Ezekiel 37 is happening in stages. God's bringing them back to the land. And then he's going to give them a new heart. It's like, no, it says really clearly here. I'll give them a new heart. I'll put my spirit within them and they'll live on the land. And somehow Zionists try to read this, the coming of Israel back to the land in 1948 and in 1967 is the restoration. It's the dry bones coming back to yep. life, which that's not the dry bones are about Israel, not the Jewish people, but Israel. And we can flush that out later. And the restoration is with the spirit cleansing you and giving you a new heart. You can't have this restoration without a new heart, without as John the Baptist says, repent, the kingdom of God's at hand. You can't mm -hmm. enter the kingdom unless you repent. So the idea that Israel's been restored in 48 and 67, and they are going to convert later on. Oh, and there are more Christians in Israel now. Seriously, that argument just doesn't, it doesn't fit the text. And it doesn't make sense of the fact that the clear indication is that Paul's using Ezekiel and Leviticus and applying it to the, the church. I'll say it, the church, the New Testament people of God's better to say the New Testament people of God as the fulfillment of these covenant promises. Mm, okay. And you write a little bit about this as well, just on, on this chunk. And I think it's in the, the New Testament in the end times. No, these it's brothers of mine. But I was thinking, uh, don't you write on the Gog Magog stuff? Probably. <laughs> I'd have to remember. But you're, yeah, probably, yeah, you're probably right, because the New Testament in the end times does deal with Armageddon and all that kind of yeah. stuff. I'm sure I dealt with it there as well. Yeah, so you definitely do it there. You do it yeah, in you. these brothers of mine, which I'm I'm assuming uh, the new book is going to handle that as well. The new book is a rewrite of these brothers of mine in a condensed version. Mm -hmm. So these brothers of mine deal with the ish, the theological issues that I just laid out in five minutes or whatever it was. And then these brothers of mine also deals with, well, here are the criticisms of Christian Zionists. They say the covenant with Israel was for an everlasting covenant. How do you answer that, Rob? They mm -hmm. say... You're a replacement theologian. How do you handle that, Rob? So I'm interacting with the Christian Zionist objections in the second half. So the new book, it's called Land of Contention, is a rewrite of the first half of the book mm -hmm. where I argue theologically. and But I also include how Christians should respond in light of October 7th, in light of the yeah. war on Gaza and Hamas's act of terror. And so I tie it specifically to that issue, which it doesn't have to be only that issue. It's how Christians are supposed to respond in times of war. Okay. And so I kind of address that a little bit, but it's only about, I, have, I actually, I, I literally got it from the publisher yesterday, but I haven't opened the document yet. So I'm assuming it's 90 pages or something like that. Yeah. So you address these things in other areas. So I think that yeah. just the point on this tangent that we've gone on mm -hmm. is that oftentimes we need to relearn and unlearn deconstruct yeah. if you will and in, in the healthiest of ways things that we've just been taught yeah and it's a evangelical culture in the last 50 years passages like ezekiel 36 37 38 through 40 yeah. 48 are always going to be assumed and just unquestioned that oh these are just talking about future these are just talking about that 
But then what do we do when we're reading passages that apply these to the people of God then, which means it still applies now. Yeah. And it's, it's not applying to then in an ethnocentric kind of way. It's applying to all the kinds of people. In the same by way, then you mean to, like Paul does to the Corinthians. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah. In the same way, how do we not read an Acts chapter 2 in yeah. Peter's sermon? And he's quoting Joel 2. And this is like day of the Lord type stuff. In exactly. which if you, we oftentimes read Joel 2 and it's like, oh, this is anticipating that future thing. And Peter's saying, oh, no, this has happened now. Exactly. And I'm wondering... As we go back to the second Corinthians passage, let's see, they shall be my people. I'm read through it. I shall be your father. You shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord yeah. Almighty. That even has that Joel type language for there. It's I'll pour out my spirit yeah. on my sons and daughters and they should prophesy or even your sons and daughters should prophesy. But it, these are things where the, the New Testament authors continue to read the Old Testament in light of what Jesus did. And it's now not only contained to Israel, but guess what? It's contained to anyone who wants to be a part of it. And that's the thing. The argument often is, oh, you're excluding Israel. Mm -hmm. You're excluding the Jewish people, which leads to anti-Semitism. And the answer is no, we're including the Gentiles. We're including them into God's people. Now, certainly unbelieving Jews, as well as any unbelieving person, uh, as Paul says in Romans 9 through 11, they're cut off. So the Jews were yeah. already part of God's people, but they're cut off if they're unbelieving. The Gentiles who believe are grafted into the tree of believing Jews. We're, we're included in the covenant. So the covenant was to Israel, no doubt. But now the covenant is including believing Gentiles. So when Paul says here, verse 18, I'll be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me. That's Israel language. That's mm -hmm. God's covenant people language. You will be my children. And so it's it's really clear and it's really emphatic. The phrase son of, it's actually interesting that Paul includes daughters here, which obviously mm -hmm. we do see in a few places, like mm -hmm. in Joel, you see it in Hosea, you see it in Isaiah. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes I will be your God and you'll be my sons. Even the gospel Luke will say, if we uh, love like God loves, we'll become sons of the most high. And there's a sense where I like to translate these things as gender neutral, like sons and daughters. But when you have sons of the Most High in Luke 6.35, for example, that's important because to be a son of meant to have the qualities, characteristics, and attributes of the Father. In John 8, when Jesus says, if you're Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. Yeah, This is, this is what it means to be children of Abraham. Do the deeds of Abraham. Or he'll say a few verses later, you're actually sons of the devil. Yep. And then he says, because you want to do the desires of your father, namely the devil. So it's this language of saying, we have become sons and daughters, including women, sons and daughters of God. And therefore we've been included into the family of God or the people of God. Or if you want to say Israel, that's fine. I just think when we say Israel church, we just make this dichotomy yeah. and binary that's often uh, misused or misunderstood. Yeah, no, absolutely. So what I didn't read when we read the passage yeah. earlier to finish out chapter six, I didn't include chapter seven, verse one. And right. this is probably one of those sections where the well-meaning and oftentimes executed yeah. chapter and verse divisions that scholars in the 1500s did to create chapter and verse divisions. This is one of those ones where it, it definitely connects and you don't want to end your reading at chapter six and just stop. Chapter seven, verse one says, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and of spirit, making holiness perfect in the fear of God. So this is obviously connected to that previous section that we just read and we can't exclude this there yeah and again it's interesting your translation said since the greek word is un which is therefore okay. and it's an emphatic use of there are several words that we can translate as therefore or phrases we can translate as therefore this is one of the more common ones and it's one of the more emphatic ones and this is the one in romans 12 like therefore I, yeah. in light of this present your bodies as a living sacrifice it's that yeah. kind of therefore and and it means the result mm -hmm. of the fact that we were this is that we need to now cleanse ourselves from all defilement because we are temples of the living God. We are therefore holy. And this is so significant. You're right that the chapter breaks in a bad place. Verse two in chapter seven clearly begins what we might say a new section. Uh, and so it could be, it should be looked at as a new section. Mm -hmm. uh, grammatically, it supports that as well. Therefore can often introduce a new section. That's fine. But it seems that, that this therefore 
is more closely linked with verse 18 of the previous chapter, 16 through 18 of the previous chapter, than it is with two and followings. Yeah, 17.1 has to be read with this conversation. Paul's point is, you have become the temple of the living God. Therefore, let's cleanse ourselves because we are holy. And it's so important because we get caught up in the theological conversation that we just had. Oh, we're the temple of God. That's so important. God dwells with us. Oh, thank God. He dwells in my heart. And that's so important. And oh, this means for the fulfillment of Israel. And what does it all mean? But there's an ethical implication and application of this that we can't overlook. We must purify ourselves. Because we have these promises, I will dwell within them, I'll walk among them, and I will be their God. Therefore, let's purify ourselves. So if you're listening to this, we can't get away from the ethical, moral, religious responsibility we have to be God's people and to purify ourselves. Yeah. If we were to sum up chapters five and six, then to finish off that chunk, we'd say that in the cross, we find God's intent to transform his people into God's new covenant people and that they themselves, they are the means through which God does his work of bringing justice into the world. That's basically what we saw yeah. in those two chapters. Yeah, exactly. And this, and what you just said there is really critical for us to embrace. So if we go back to second Corinthians five, verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creature. The old have passed away, the new things have come. So there's that first, that status, who we are. We are a new creation. And this is really significant to understand the role of the new creation and what that means. It's not like the kingdoms of the world. It's like the kingdom of God. And I, as I said, I think last week or a couple weeks ago, I'm hoping to do a series of live streams, maybe by January, if not December of 2024, January of 2025, where I really unpack what this means, the kind of the eschatology of it all, the kingdom theology of it all, and the biblical story of it all, what it means. But the new creation is the book of Revelation. The new creation is what we're looking forward to. But Paul's interest, it's already here now. And therefore, he goes on to say, therefore, in verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. I beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And I, what you said at the end there was God's doing the work of bringing his justice to the world through us. That's exactly the case. The purpose or goal is so that we might become the righteousness of God. Oh, wow. How do we understand that term righteousness? Because it's oftentimes used in a Reformation kind of way mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to speak of being cleansed from personal sin. So I get Jesus's righteousness and he takes my sin. It's that idea of the great exchange. Is that the way we are to understand that here? Yeah, not at all. So I'm working on a book with Ian Spencer on the gospel, the kingdom and justice. And Ian's really fleshing out in great depth. We're going to have to simplify what he's writing on the nature of righteousness and what it all means. But it's intimately connected with God's justice, that God is just and he desires to create a just society Adam and Eve were created to be kings and queens to oversee God's just rule and God's just kingdom. So what it means then is that we are to be the ones through which God does the work of bringing justice. This is so critical because what we've done, Vinny, is we've made the gospel about us. Jesus died for my sins. You're, we're sinners. We need a Savior. Jesus died for our sins. If we believe in him, we can go to heaven when we die. And everything else is just like added on. It's, oh, you should be a good person these days. You should do good things. And so we translate righteousness in that same sense. Oh, it's our state before God, who we are. And sure, that's correct. But righteousness and justice are intimately connected throughout the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And the idea of that is Paul's answer is we are ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us, not just to tell people about Jesus so they can go to heaven, but to do the work of the kingdom. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So the idea of the self-centered gospel of Christianity, that it's about you and about us, radically undermines the gospel is about Jesus, mm -hmm. about who he is, about God's desire to walk among us, to dwell in our midst, to restore his creation. And that's exactly what Paul's saying has happened is the, the, the story of creation is being fulfilled in the church in Corinth and in you. And, and maybe I'll, I'll dive into this really briefly here, Vinny. And that is, 
Revelation 21 and 22 quotes Leviticus 26 and Ezekiel mm -hmm. 37. The new Jerusalem is the fulfillment. I think it's Revelation 21, verse 3. I will dwell among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. That's Revelation mm -hmm. 21, verse 3. Oh, there you go. What Leviticus said would happen, that God will dwell among them, and he'll be, they'll be his people in the covenant, didn't happen. They end up, in, end up in exile. So Ezekiel comes along and says, don't worry, when God restores us, he's going to restore us, and he's going to give us a new heart. He's going to pour out a spirit amongst us. And then what Leviticus said was going to happen will happen. So that's it. Ezekiel 37, where God will give us a new heart and dwell among us and be there, be our God, and he'll be, his, mm -hmm. he'll be his people and he'll walk among us. And then we skip to Revelation 21 and say, oh, that's fulfilled in the, in the New Jerusalem. And Paul's answer is, it's also being fulfilled in mm. the church in Corinth. I hope that made sense. What I just said clearly that mm -hmm. is that it's not just a future fulfillment. The end times have already begun. And the key feature of the end times is that God dwells with us and mm. we with him and that we are his temples. Therefore, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement. This is the biblical story coming to fulfillment. Mm, mm, that's so, so good. Let's do the therefore, if you don't believe us, you're going to hell part. And therefore, if you don't no. financially support us, you're going and, to hell. There you go. And if... You, and if we, we, you guys, we have truckloads full of prayer hankies that we just want to send out, <laughs> and you guys aren't giving. We got a new, <laughs> we got a new shipment. That's right. Gene yes. Scott. Gene Scott's the guy. G Dr. Gene Scott, man. I used to watch that guy. I I, I always thought he was uh, very entertaining because he'd dress up in like different costumes and stuff. Oh, I just remember his curly hair. And like, yeah. I'm yeah. not reading anymore. The phones aren't ringing. Yep. I'm not reading until those, those phones start ringing. Like, yeah. We, wa we his, would watch him for like comedy hour. Yes. Yeah. I, I remember as a little kid because he would be in the Bay Area and I'd watch him on oh. TV. And yeah. I, he was in LA. I thought it was where he, but he came out of it. Yeah, but I, he would be broadcasting the barriers. Okay. I'd watch yeah, it. Oh, yeah. Before YouTube, that was our entertainment. Yeah, my dad would come out and I'd be like watching this guy on TV because he'd be wearing like, I remember wearing, wearing like an army helmet and like wearing gear. He would just, wear, and I just found this guy on TV. And my dad's like, what are you doing? I'm like six years old. Yeah. <laughs> his yeah. daughter ended up taking over his ministry, I want to say, oh, and she continued doing stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that's a uh, tangent. Anyway. Yeah. So speaking of which, you can support us at Determined Truth. We promise to not wear army garb or dress up. Hey, if you want to support us, you can find us on DeterminedTruth.com where there's a give tab and you could support. And we are having a contest this week or this month, actually. <laughs> we are. Uh, who could raise more support? So if you like me better, you could click on the Vinny tab. If you okay. like, if you feel bad for Rob, you could click on the Rob tab. You should probably do the Vinny tab. But there's that's a lot of reasons happening. to feel bad for Rob, though, Vinny. So <laughs> you, you lost it there. Yeah, that's I true. really feel bad for that guy. Yeah, yeah. Most people do. That's you true. have live streams, once again, that you are always popping up. So if you want to yeah. stay up to date in the real time, follow Rob on his socials because he's always going to be posting those. Uh, and subscribe yeah. to the German Truth YouTube page because yep. that's where you get notifications of upcoming live streams. Obviously, by the time this goes live, we will already have recorded stuff and just go to the YouTube page. We'll, we, we're doing one on mass incarceration. We're yeah. doing one on CRT, which should be really interesting. What is critical race theory and why is everyone so upset about it? Yeah. And you're like, I'm not listening to that. So I think we need to listen to this. Mm. So not saying we're going to agree with everything. I certainly don't think we are going to agree with that. Danny and I will agree with everything, but I think it's worth your listen. Yeah, yeah, very good. And then we will be back next week. We'll continue getting to the point where we get closer to wrapping up Second Corinthians and onto Galatians. Yeah. And uh, oh, yeah, we're gonna talk it. about money next week. That'd be cool. I don't want to talk about money. <laughs> it's a sore spot. <laughs> it's a yeah. sore spot. Let's not talk about I, money. I, yeah. All right, everyone. Hope you have a great week. We'll catch you next week. I want to thank you for joining us on today's podcast, and we would love for you to share the work of Determined Truth with others. Please follow this podcast and give a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Your review will go a long way towards helping others find this podcast. Then, share it with others so that we can get the word of the gospel of the kingdom to more people.